Hello everybody, Elizabeth's group here in lockdown and this is our lockdown film number three. One of the things that is so disappointing to us is that next month we were going to have our inaugural Elizabeth Elmy lecture which is something that we hope we will carry out every year but this year was going to be really special because we had Elizabeth's biographer and our patron Dr Maureen Wright coming along to do that first lecture. It's not going to happen now, not this month anyway, so um, we have, by the miracle of technology, actually got Dr Wright with us this afternoon. Um, hello Maureen. Hello Susan and hello everyone from Elizabeth's group and the wider world. It's good to be with you. We've had a few technical problems trying to get this going, but we're running now, thankfully. We've got a few questions that we were going to ask uh, Dr. Wright. And the first one was, Maureen, when did you first hear about Elizabeth? Because she's been very buried, hasn't she? Uh, she's been hiding away in history. Yes, um, the first, one of the first women, um, Sheila Robotham, to write women's history, used that marvellous phrase, hidden from history, and Elizabeth has been until the 21st century uh, very much one of those hidden women. Uh, I first found out about her in 2001 um, when I was studying for my undergraduate degree at the University of Portsmouth. My, super, my supervisor, who would become my PhD supervisor there, uh, Professor Jude Purvis, introduced me to Elizabeth. She knew enough about her to consider she'd make a really interesting topic for a full-length biographical study uh, for a PhD. And I completed that uh, with the support of the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the autumn of 2007. Um, when you start off something like this, you have to know there's enough material. And there's certainly enough material out there uh, about Elizabeth, including a cache of 3,000 handwritten letters, two and a half thousand of which um, sit uh, very, very under-researched in the British Library. She's a radical. She is certainly not backward in coming forward. She suffer fools, not at all. And she makes a really encouraging um, personality for I believe the young women of today to study. Absolutely. One of the things that, that always saddens me is the fact that uh, we lost such a lot of Elizabeth's writings and I suspect probably her poetry as well as her autobiography uh, when her house was emptied and her paperwork recycled. It, it just seems so terrible that that happened. She does leave a uh, note in one of her letters that tells you how big that archive was. Um, I know people in Congleton are aware of where her house is and her archive filled one whole downstairs room in that house. Uh, it went right back to the very first um, changes if you like in legislation for women uh, the divorce act of 1857 and her archive grew and grew until um well in 1907 she loaned some of it to sylvia pankhurst and she bemoans the fact that sylvia is, ta is tardy in returning it but it grew and grew until her active work finished um which i can roughly date to when she's 80 in 1913. Um, but yes, it disappeared. The date I can get closest to for that is someone in 1917, when we do have an eyewitness who saw it disappearing from the house in Bug Lawton in wheelbarrows. That's so, that's so sad. And, <sighs> For me, there's a little bit of a mystery there because she did have a son, uh, Frank, and I, I wondered wh what happened that he allowed that to happen. Is it possible he could have been um, away at the war? Um, I think in the case of Frank, I don't think he would have been away at the war because I think he would have been a conscientious objector. Ah. He, if he followed 
the um, premise of his mother and father, he certainly would have been a conscientious objector. They were ardent pacifists. Um, he died in the 1920s. He lived not too far away. He lived in Sandbach. Um, and I wonder if Elizabeth, who by that time I probably think was in the nursing home in Manchester where she later died, I think the house then could have been up for sale and I think he may have moved. He worked for the council, uh, uh, at least he did until I can sort of last trace him. Um, and I wonder if his office was in Sandbach and he may have moved over there. I think the sale of the house is the likeliest reason. Um, there are hints that this, this archive was given to the war effort in, in what was called a paper drive. Um, like people sacrificed their saucepans for the aluminium and that in the Second World War. Um, I can hardly think that Elizabeth, ardent pacifist that she was, would have wanted anything to do with anything of hers going to the war effort. But of course, we are, we are not there to, to know any different. I only have glimpses of, of the event, but it is quite shocking. Had um, her autobiography survived uh, and had this archive um, survived, it would have made a comprehensive women's suffrage collection. Whereas rather now we trace it from personal correspondence. And the um, documents relating to some of the organisations Elizabeth worked for, which she took it on herself to preserve. Yes, it, it, it's really bad that it, it's piecing that together is, um, as you say, very difficult, very difficult. Uh, there's a lot of, or oh, we, have been, when we've been doing our own research, local research, um, we have often wondered why Elizabeth actually moved to Congleton. Have you got any theories on that? Well, I have a, a, a sort of prop probable and a rather romantic theory over that. The, pr the probable theory is that she wished to relocate her school, um, which up until 1867 was um, located in the district of Boothtown near Worsley. It was a school for middle-class girls, but they didn't learn the standard curriculum that middle-class girls favoured, that of the development of accomplishments in order for them to marry well. Elizabeth's girls rather learnt things to support themselves. Um, they learnt political economy from the texts of uh, John Stuart Mill. They learnt arithmetic, they learnt English language, they learnt botany, they learnt biology. They had more of what we would term today of a secondary school curriculum. When she moved to Moody Hall in 1867, I think she was going for larger premises, well, um, maybe was one reason. But if we look down the romantic route, um, this was a time when a certain gentleman called Ben Elmy, uh, also moved to the town of Congleton. Now, Ben, he had been um, a textile manufacturer uh, at a mill in Mo Mobberley, close by, but he was looking to branch out and buy his own textile mills, which he did. He ended up owning three in Congleton, one in partnership. But the one in, Mo in, in Mobberley, he managed... And it was his declared intention uh, that he paid the his his women workers himself in cash because of course then um, the women's husbands or fathers could actually come to the mill and collect their money on payday because this is before the 1870 Married Women's Property Act with which both Ben and Elizabeth had a lot to do. They met they had um, a great interest in uh, adult education as well as um, the education of children and young people and they were both active in a local education society uh, that was set up in Congleton I believe well at least most likely by themselves.
Brilliant. So that's the romantic aspect of it, um, because they became a couple quite soon after that. Yeah. Well, I, I know Elizabeth wouldn't have said this, but they were a match made in heaven, weren't they? <laughs> yes, they were. <laughs> Let's go on to your lecture. Your lecture was going to be about marriage and the vote. Let's say a little bit about that. Well, of course, for many women, including most of Elizabeth's pupils, I think um, most women grew up expecting to marry. And in those days where marital rape was not criminalised and there was little in the way of birth control, uh, motherhood and children were sort of the natural consequence of being married. But Elizabeth managed to turn the, um, the birth of children into something which gave women um, a complete shift in the way they campaigned for the vote. Prior to the 1890s, all suffragists campaigned on the grounds of what they could do for the nation could they become factory inspectors could they become school teachers could they become um people who worked as poor law guardians as harriet uh, as elizabeth's great friend harriet mcgillcam did um these were nurturing professions so how do you get from suffragist campaign to that uh, to suffragist campaigning um, and linking motherhood to their militant campaign for the vote in 1903. The crux of the issue uh, was the outbreak of the Boer War, when the British government sent troops to um, fight in South Africa on the behalf of men who were sent there to work or to to live um, in, in the army or for whatever reason, but the South Africans who governed the Transvaal and the Orange Free Strait State at the time, uh, the Boers, took away the rights of those British settlers to vote. And no matter what, the only thing that would change their minds, the British government decided, was to send in military force. This happened at the end of 1889 and on the grounds that the British men would not consent not to have the vote and would not consent to obey the rules that they had no hand in making. Now Elizabeth had written on this uh, subject of consent to making rules uh, in, in 1895 and she'd actually said that women uh, who had no power then to um, not consent to having children had the better claim to the vote than the men who would be sent in um, as soldiers to claim it. Uh, because women lost their lives, as the soldiers did, but women lost their lives in childbirth. And what she wanted was to criminalise marital rape so as women could not consent to sexual intercourse with men. They wanted that to be a criminal offence. And also, if people go to war on the subject and men will be killed on behalf of gaining the vote, the, the most radical suffragists then set about saying, well, hang on a minute, women offer up their lives every single day to give birth and what we want to do we think that's more important than actually letting our sons our husbands our brothers go off to war to claim the vote on behalf of other men and that was how they did it and it became a really good method of propaganda to actually associate childbirth, which is so feminine, so feminine a concept and so domestic, do, domestic a concept with the militant campaign. Okay, so if you can fight for the vote with guns, so can we. Um, although Elizabeth never, of course, as a pacifist herself, uh, brought the matter of guns into it, 
she did see militancy in that of campaigning to march in campaign to go on hunger strike as the suffragettes later did she did see that as perfectly okay fascinating i can't wait for the lecture i really can't Thank you very much for coming along, uh, talking to me this afternoon. Just one last question. Have you seen our little book? I have seen your little book and I think it's great. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody, and keep safe and keep thinking about Elizabeth because we will be back. Thank you.